um, today's camp discussion, we'll be doing our campfire convos and, uh, you know, we'll be discussing news in the world of sync and answering your questions, uh, about sync. So stick around. And, uh, before we get started, we just ask that if you feel like this, uh, this topic uh, about sync and getting your music and TV and film would be of interest or helpful to any other artists, composers, songwriters, um, be sure to ping them into the room. You can tap the plus icon at the bottom right of your screen and uh, ping a few uh, folk into the room. And uh, we'll just have a, a really enriching, lively, uh, amazing, uh, I'm trying to think of other adjectives, <laughs> discussion tonight. So uh, I'm going to get, go ahead and kick it over to Eric uh, to kind of get us started with our, our camp combo tonight. Cool, cool, cool. Good to see you all here. All right, so... Um... What we're going to be doing with uh, these camp conversations, we kind of have different topics that we'll talk about. Uh, we'll do a mix of kind of the news of what's going on in sync, um, what's trending in sync um, at the time, and then also kind of get into um, uh, some sync 101 questions that we've been seeing, kind of give you all a chance to ask any questions that you have. And um, yeah, some other cool stuff. So let's talk uh, real quick with uh, some of the people who are on stage. We've got Annalise here today. How you doing, Annalise? Hi, how's it going, guys? Sorry, let me turn off this very loud air conditioner. Um, <laughs> oh, good. How's it going, What's up, guys? What's Annalise? Good, I'm, good. I'm good. I'm busy, you know, writing and engineering and those kind of things. Happy to be here. Always good to have you, Angelica, Annalicia. Um, we've let's, we've had you on stage a number of times. Why don't you, um, for those who don't know you, give give the quick thirty second rundown of um, what you do? Because I you, I know you engineer, produce, but give them give them the rundown. So I'm in Toronto. Uh, I came up mostly as an engineer um, of albums and a ton of audio post, and then I did a bunch of film music. Um, and now for the last few years, I've added to that a lot of uh, songwriting for television. So I've written a bunch of stuff for a bunch of Canadian kids shows and licensed a ton of music into some shows. And recently uh, have been blessed to meet Steph Fink, who has uh, allowed me to do some American writing. And that snorting is my bulldog who is beside me, if you hear it. It is snorting, it's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's what that was. It's nice. <laughs> well, real good to have you. Very. Holly good. likes to snore during se Zoom sessions too, which is always yeah. Alive. She snores <laughs> through all of our writing sessions, doesn't she? <laughs> She's trying to get a credit. I always Any give day. her credit. <laughs> that's what's up. And we got a uh, psychosis here. Psychosis, how you doing? Oh, psychosis. Yo, what's good, family? How's everybody? Doing good. How are you? Man, I'm doing well. It's uh it's been a busy week for me, man. I'm I'm wearing one of my mini hats. Um uh working with some uh public employees out here striking for for higher wages with them. You know, that goes along with something that's gonna turn into a dope song, hopefully. So it's been a crazy week, but look but it's been good, man. Hopefully everybody having a good week as well. You're always so involved in what's going on in your city. I feel like you and um, Kick is another one who are good examples of, of yeah. people who are like not just making music, but like really tied into the city. I changing the really, world. Yeah, it's really dope. But like locally, you know, changing it locally, yeah, which is real dope. And I heard the big announcement that Psychosis is back in the studio after a brief hiatus. So I'm all somebody. You know. Can't wait for that. Yeah, you got, hey, listen, you know, Eric, Eric got part to do with that. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going back. Um, I, I like a lot of uh, artists, you know, I wear many hats, like I said, which is something I, I'd say a lot. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but it's been nine months since I actually recorded a record. Um, but what I try to do is utilize the music that I have to the best of my ability, space it out, different marketing ways, scheduling videos, scheduling shows, and then keeping things going so that it's not the constant pressure. Like, well, how do I stay in front of a camera all day, every day? when I'm trying to balance all these different things that I want to do in my community and in my family life. So uh, to anybody that's out there listening, you know, don't feel pressure to constantly, you know, force yourself, you know, let yourself get in a good groove, 
if it takes time, sometimes it takes time. Sometimes you got to wait till your life changes before you find motivation to write music. So don't put pressure on yourself. Keep moving. I like that. Um, you know, it'd be interesting both to hear um, you and Daraj has some insight into this too. So it'd be cool to hear a perspective on just how are you doing this balancing act? So you just shared some insight psychosis. So like you kind of schedule things. It sounds like maybe you do things, um, you know, seasonally. So you have like your work. I know you're doing uh, a lot of mentoring things. You got your activism stuff happening. You get the real estate happening. Um, and Daraj is only a few, has it been a month, you know, um, from the full-time, from the full-time job. So would love to hear um, while we're on this, just your thoughts on strategies and how you're balancing kind of getting stuff done, staying creative, getting creative, but also like meeting all your ob obligations. You got any thoughts on that psychosis? Yeah. So for me, like I'm, when you, when you're an artist, first of all, like music is in your head, like you don't have to be in a studio. Like for me, I'm, I'm the person who makes drums on the steering wheel. I'm beatboxing and freestyling when I'm walking down the street and I got to remind myself that that's not normal. <laughs> Most people get freaked out. So music is always on my mind, but it's, it's like, okay, the, the act or the business of it is what will definitely drain you. But it's also the most important part, which is what, which is so dope about control camp is that you guys and, and this community does a great job of educating people on um, the technical and, and creative side, but also the business side and how to make that not, super stressful so for me um i kind of like i said me personally i'm i'm more of of, of a front-facing artist than i am specifically somebody who writes for sync but when i do come across music i'll put it in the back of my mind i'll save it in my drive and i'll be like hey that's something i'm gonna write for that could be a good club song one day or this right here maybe the next song i'm gonna pitch um and i'm just gonna formulate ideas about it formulate you know um lyrics around it before i even go write it down so by the time i go into the studio or by the time i sit down and say hey i'm going into you know into the booth it's not like i gotta turn it on it's just that i gotta turn it up you know so it's not it's never turned off it's just i put it on you know kind of like hover mode until i'm done doing the things that are you know right in front of me that i really you know want to do so like i said you know I'm, I'm helping strike with workers at at the at the cook county jail in chicago um at stroger hospital and those things are very important to me and but so is music so i try to make sure i don't put too much pressure on myself either way but but always music's always on my mind so it's just time to turn it up sometime and that's what i try to do i love that i love that um Daraj, you get anything you want to add to that from your perspective? Yeah, I I like this question um, a lot because I think I've gone through not even just with music, but just in life. You know, just the the I, I relate and resonate a lot with psychosis because you know the the multi hyphenate kind of multiple like wearing a multiple hats um, has kind of been a trend throughout my life, not just you know kind of in the current season, but like i think what psychosis is kind of saying is important too where it's just identifying like when is the appropriate season for you to you know kind of be focusing on what you know what i mean i think kind of clear goals clear and specific goals to help you know answer those questions and you know learning where to give your yes and where to give your no you know kind of helps you to you know really create the type of focus and momentum you're looking for and i know that's what I found to be helpful for me when I um, gave myself permission to focus on, you know, a, a particular, you know, area in life that I just wanted to like really um, grow, you know what I mean? And that became, you know, all right, this is my thing. How can I uh, sit? I'm really big, you know, we talk about all the time, I'm really big on systems and processes. So I, I try to like figure out what I'm doing and, and, and figure out if I'm if I'm doing it the same way each time, like how can I document that and then bring in help to kind of work those systems um, or even myself working the system. Um, it just creates, you know, a certain level of predictability and helps you scale and helps you to do more. Like for me, that's kind of been the lifeline. It's just like I need to get on a fixed schedule and plan out my days accordingly 
um, and give room for the things that I feel like will help me be most productive and create the most momentum. Um, and one thing I was sharing with somebody too, I think, you know, with all of us, you know, finding that thing that, you know, you're, you're obsessed with in a sense, like, I think for all of us, like music becomes like a, an obsession is something that we would do, you know, whether or not we're getting paid for. And that's like a really good indicator. And so figuring out like, when is it time to just flip the switch and go hard on that thing? Cause if you got the obsession, I think part, right. It helps, you know, just keep you motivated and keep in it. Like I write so much, I write so many songs. I love doing this stuff. You know what I mean? Like I'm obsessed with it. And so it helps drive, um, you know, like the, uh, it helps drive you, you know, closer towards, you know, wherever it is you're striving to. Um, so yeah, that's my little bit. I don't want to go too long. <laughs> I, no, that's dope though. And I love it. I, um, I actually want to stay on this for a little while because we really haven't talked about necessarily, necessarily, we haven't talked about just kind of balance, especially if you have a full-time or a part-time job and you're trying to get income in other places, why you're trying to figure out how to get income from music or income in sync. I know uh, I used to work in the IT industry. I did um, software development. I did project management. And I and I left. Um, I had an opportunity to leave. This was like 2004. And this you know, led to me moving to Atlanta. But even there, while I was still trying to figure out how to make ends meet, I started teaching music lessons. And, um, you know, I, I did that for many years um i only closed that business like two years ago right like about a year before it was right before the pandemic so it was probably you know it was very timely it was like leading right to the pandemic when i decided to kind of i could go kind of do kind of sync full time but up till that it had always been the music lessons as a consistent um source of income i think for me the balancing had been the key turnaround for me figuring out how to balance stuff was learning that it's okay to say no to stuff. And the more comfortable I got saying no to things, and this could be everything from volunteering in church and being asked to be on a certain committee to, you know, uh, friends who wanted to do something or some cool opportunity that came around, like f- realizing that it was okay to disappoint other people um, in pursuit of what I was most passionate and what I believe most strongly about when I became more comfortable with that, I I was really able to go a lot harder and kind of prioritize my time. I think Daraj, you're really, really good at prioritizing your time and you're really good. I've said it before and others. I saw that when we took the course together and how when a certain time hit, no matter what we were doing in the group, you were like, I've allotted two hours to this. Two hours is up. I got to go on to the next thing. Sorry, y'all, I'm out. And it was, you know, you didn't, it wasn't sorry. It was unap- unapologetic. And I noted that kind of from the, from the beginning. So um, um, I want to introduce other people on the stage. But before we get into that, anybody want to jump in just on? And this is if, if you've worked, you know, if, you're, if you are doing your own thing, whether it's moving to full-time income or just, just trying to figure out how to get that work life work life balance or being able to prioritize work any insights on how to keep the main thing the main thing and any insights to share with people who are trying to make sync their full-time stuff while they're juggling um, a bunch of other things anybody on the panel want to jump in on that i would love to hear from clint if he's there or available hey what's up guys yeah, I just I just came in. Um, so I guess so. So what perspective are you guys looking so for? We so would I, I, we're talking we were talking about um, both psychosis and Daraj have different have similar but different methods of balancing doing other work. Daraj was working full time up until about a month ago. Psychosis is balancing other projects and social activism and other things and kind of has a period of time where he's focused on recording. And so we're just talking about, one, strategies for balancing sync work while you're doing other things for income and just, you know, what either you do personally or recommendations or what you have done in the past, you know, to to balance it and suggestions for other people who are working a job and trying to also work on sync. Okay. Yeah, that's that's super good. So. Um, it's funny that you mentioned you you worked in IT some some years ago. I actually have an IT background as well. 
um, and re- recently decided, well, as of last year, decided to um, finally go in, into to music full time. Um, but I guess the the balancing act for me was, I guess, the good thing about the job that I had was that I was like a field tech. So I was working on, you know, computer servers, things like that. Um, so I still kind of had some freedom and flexibility in that sense, because I didn't have to sit in the office. Um, so I was able to, you know, if I had to jump on a phone call, still take those phone calls. Um, if I had time in between calls, you know, I was able to follow up on emails. Um, <clears throat> if, if, if it was time where I was just sitting, you know, I would use that time instead of just sitting there, you know, doing something unproductive or just eating lunch, taking a nap or something, I would kind of use that time to search for more opportunities, whether that's researching different licensing companies, um, you know, different music supervisors I can reach out to. I would use any downtime I had at work to be productive and push, you know, my business forward. Um, And then, you know, once I came home, you know, my wife and I, shout out to my wife, because she was like super understanding and supportive and even sacrificial to a point because, you know, it it requires time. If you're trying to make music your full-time job, you're going to have to come home, eat, spend time with the wife, and then kind of get back to work. So our schedules kind of worked out because she was working um, so early in the morning that she would have to go to bed early. So once she went to bed, that's when I would have my allotted time you know, from, it was either like eight or nine to like two in the morning. And I, that would be my slot like every day to focus on music, focus on my business and continue to grow it. And, um, nothing happened during that time. That was just my block of time. Um, I didn't go out, didn't socialize a whole lot unless it was, you know, like a, a Grammy event, like, you know, like the little the recording Academy events, something that was productive, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. And, and I, I love what you guys said, as far as just saying no to a lot of things that that's not contributing to the ultimate goal or the ultimate vision. Um, I know I've, I've even personally, cause I, I grew up playing in church all the time. I've even you know, just kind of slow down on that because just the time required to practice songs, learn songs, go to rehearsals, play multiple services. Like it was just, it was starting to, I guess my passion was just starting to shift from the live performance, the live musician to, I just honestly want to be in the studio and just focus on sync. So that was, that's kind of, kind of how I did it. Just had that, that time set aside. And then, you know, any time, extra time at work, it was, it was dedicated towards moving the business forward. Hey, the, yeah. <laughs> the church out here taking L's, man. They losing all the good <laughs> yeah, this- One other thing I, I want to add to that, um, Eric, um, is that one thing that helps it besides the time management is when you get a little more comfortable and you don't have to be your stage name versus your government name, when you get more comfortable and you, and you figure out how to talk to people about the music you make or that you produce or that you write and people around you get a little more sense of what you're doing. You know, you can make your, if your boss becomes a fan of your music, they'll make exceptions for you and then let you move around and let you do stuff. Cause when you feel comfortable in your skin to say, this is what I do. Yeah, I'm here with you guys, but this is what I do. People around you kind of, uh, you know, they, they, they react to it different ways, but sometimes it's in a great way and they will make moves for you or sometimes make connections with you to allow you to be away from the job or away from the pressure. So you can do what, what actually matters. That's such a powerful um, point. And I got to say, when I, when I was working for the consulting firm, I never got that level of comfort. I, it was actually one of the reasons why I had to figure out how to get out of there is, is I felt like I was not being myself. Even like, you know, we were wearing khaki pants and, uh, you know, collared polo shirts every day. And, you know, it was a very, con- you know, kind of conservative firm and I did not feel like I could kind of talk about it. The plus was all consuming. We were there 12 hours a day, 70 days a week. And I 
even though I'm a Gemini, I was very uncomfortable with feeling like I had these two different lives going on. And like the one that was taking up the most of the time wasn't the real one. So I never got that. I, I, I would wish I would have had that kind of thought back then, but I never got that level of comfort. I just always felt uncomfortable. Like I wasn't in my skin doing what I was doing the work. I felt, I felt the same way, Eric. Same. It's some interesting psychosis was saying too, uh, or made me think of, I, I know when you kind of make that pivot as well, and you're like focused on, you know, that thing in particular that you feel like is, you know, like this is, this is, this is the goal is my pursuit. Like once you really go all in on it, I feel like more like going on and also tell people, this is kind of the route you're going, like more stuff in the, you know, atmosphere of what you're trying to do kind of gets attracted to you. And I think it's different when, you know, you're kind of doing, your, you know, you're stretching a few different ways. Like, I don't know that people always like you, you may not always come top of mind for the thing that you're really after. And so I've noticed that because even with myself, like, you know, when I when I stopped doing like even within music, like there were certain things I stopped doing within music. Like I stopped doing shows. I stopped trying to sell merch. I stopped trying to do all this other stuff. And I just kind of prioritized sync. And, and I feel like that's when I saw the momentum I was actually looking for. And I didn't do any more like design work and branding for clients and stuff like that. Like I, I just, I said no to a lot of things and I just gave myself permission for like the first time in my life to just focus on this. And I just saw more, you know, uh, like more of what I was looking for in a shorter amount of time and more people were thinking of me for this particular thing. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I think that's tricky sometimes. Like it's, uh, for some people, that could be tricky because it seems like with this whole career, it's about throwing a lot of darts in a lot of different directions. And like you had the insight to like, you know, you'd already done, you done you know, you did the, the indie route, you toured, you performed, you did other stuff, you juggled. And you came to this point where you're like, you know what, I'm going all in on, on sync. And people don't necessarily know what they're all in. Right. And I, I agree with that, too, because like, like I, I was trying to find my all in like years ago. Like I was doing a few different things to try to figure out what that was. And then sync kind of showed up. And that was the first that was the first time I, I think I kind of focused on a thing. Like I was doing a bunch of things all at once. And for me, it just I, I wasn't seeing what I was hoping for um, because I think for myself, I was like too spread thin. But it was that juggling of trying to figure out, like, what do I like? I learned for myself, like, what do I really like? You know what I mean? Like, I remember doing like, you know, branding for um, the label that I was with. And after a while, it just got taxing. It was just like, I don't know that I like doing this in this way. And so I kind of wrote that off the list, um, at least in that way for that season. Um, and then even when I tried sync, it was something that I just I said, I'm going to give myself for the rest of the year. You know what I mean? See how this goes. And it just turned a corner for me. I was like, oh, shoot, I got something here. You know what I mean? But by all means, I don't, I don't want to be prescriptive. And I think everybody's journey is different. So I, I agree with that, though, Eric. No, you put good. I, I love it. I love that. You, I love that you can share that. And I, I think it's really, really powerful. Um, all right. It's 830. This has been a great warm up uh, convo. And so before we transition into kind of the next topic, this is if, if you know, if you just tuned in, this is Control Camp. We are a community of, of people at every level of the sync industry from composers, producers, independent artists, supervisors, executives, etc. All uh, focused on learning, contributing and developing ourselves in the areas of music for film, TV, video games, ads, etc. cetera. Uh, so thanks for being here. If you want to know more information about us, you can go to controlcamp.com. Control is spelled C-T-R-L. And uh, if, you want, if you're want, if you not following the club, click the little green icon above my picture. And uh, that'll also get you access to our after party, which starts at 10 o'clock after this. It'll only show up in your hallway if you're following uh, the club. Um, all right. So who else is on the stage? Oh, I see you, Steph. Oh, yeah. I was just, I wanted to jump in quick to say hello to Amanda, who joined us, and Andy, one of our, you know, and Koichi, who are our regulars, as well as welcome Laurel Stearns, which is her very first time in Control Camp and one of her first times on Clubhouse. She didn't even know how to unmute her mic yet. She's so brand new. So 
we're going to give her the warm welcome and know that if you need her, she might take a beat. <laughs> so give her the, the microphone. Welcome, more. Laurel. Oh, thanks, you guys. Yeah, you know, Samsung wasn't welcome to Clubhouse for a while. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you now. <laughs> and Laurel is one of my favorite managers. And Laurel, would you mind introducing yourself? Because she's one of the most amazing human beings who knows everyone in the music industry, literally everyone. Uh, but I want, I think it's better coming from you. So kind. Thank you all for the warm welcome. Um, I Yes, I am a manager over at Primary Wave and uh, long, long history in this business um, on both sides, label and management from capital to red light to primary wave. And, you know, just, just chiming in, listening in here because our business is evolving and changing daily. I mean, you know, at one minute, this platform is one thing and then it shifts into the next, you know, AKA TikTok <laughs> or whatever. And uh, there, you know, there's so many, you guys are in the sync realm and I'm just taking in all of this information because I manage uh, a couple artists that are multidisciplinary that work in the composition world and, you know, really focused on building what they're doing and, and doing it in a way that's elegant. Like they, they don't want to do certain things, you know, they've gotten offers to do horror films or, and, and I mean, one of them can't even watch a horror film, so she can't do that, but she can score a Super Bowl commercial. So, you know, we're, we're just feeling our way around all these different areas of building content for people, building score for people, you know, licensing songs and tracks. And it's, it's a fascinating journey and it's a place of discovery. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and contribute however I can. Awesome. We're so happy to have you. So glad you came up on the stage. Um, Amanda, how are you today? I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a little tired, honestly. I had to take one of my best friends to the airport at five o'clock in the morning. That is a good friend right there. That For is those a of great friend. For those who don't live in LA, I know <laughs> that is like next level friendship. From Studio City. <laughs> oh, my oh my God. God. <laughs> so LA, LAX, not Burbank, I take it. Yeah. Oof, good friend. <laughs> glad, to, glad to have you here. And for those of you who are new to our room, Amanda is an incredible attorney. And while she drops amazing wisdom on us, she's not our attorney. So I will give you the warning in advance to remember that anything that we say or she says is not to be taken as legal advice and to definitely find your own lawyers. Definitely. Um, uh, Atik, how are you today? I'm good. How's everybody doing? Doing good. Good Set to work. see you. Oh, at work, just grinding. Well, thanks for jumping in while you're at work. We appreciate that. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll be. I'll have you guys on in the background. I have. I have uh, trying to find some music for Hall of Fame, so I'm working on that for a presenter pieces. So I'm working on that right now. Koichi, good to see you. What up, what up? What Sorry, up? I'm like in and out also. I'm at the studio, so. Um... No worries. Oh, we're going to get the heat. Drop some bars. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Heat, sir. Bars, no. <laughs> cool. No worries. Andy, good to see you always. Good to be here. Thank you. I'm also doing some tedious stuff. I'm researching Russian public domain law, which is really fun. Oh, my God. I'm um, so curious about that. Well, yeah. I mean, things are often in copyright, uh, uh, out of copyright in lots of countries, but you've got to be careful with all the conventions like Russia. Does Russia take part in agreements that were made like in 2011 and things? So. I work, strangely working on three films being made by three different Russian production companies. Really interesting films involving a lot of jazz and all set around the 1930s. So they keep giving me all these songs and saying, this is public domain, isn't it? And I'm like, uh, I'll check. <laughs> I love that. This is I, Andy was telling us about this offline too. And I will say, this is like a really good reminder when we say there is truly a need for all songs in film and television and content, literally all songs from all genres in all eras. 
I have a question for the stage while, while Eric's coming back. Um, have you guys now seen a massive pickup in work? Especially, I... Kind of attributed to COVID, um, kind of waning a little or giving us a break. And I feel like everyone's trying to get in while we know we can still, you know, get back to production and do the things. Are you getting super busy? Are you feeling things pick up a lot? I feel like now everyone's like, I'm in Clubhouse. It's not like the early days where we have all this time on our hands. It's kind of like, you know, I'm in Clubhouse, but I'm also doing 10 other things. Everybody said they're working. I noticed that today. 100%. I mean, it was today was crazy. A couple searches came in and I was like, oh my God, it's like next week doesn't exist. It's like right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you guys, like next week does, it's going to happen. But it was like today, need stems, need this, stat. So yes, stuff, 100%. I don't know if it's the same down there in LA for you guys, but I feel like um, all of a sudden the like real live through COVID, a lot of like um, cartoon production work has been happening and now people have real production schedules with real people happening and are lining up all of their post and music and stuff like that now like that seems to be ramping up at an accelerated pace 100 percent, it was like nothing to everything andy i bet you are feeling that one a little well, yeah, but it's also festivals now. Fest, uh, Sundance and festivals are likely to go ahead. The panic to get everything ready for those is happening even now. I mean, it usually starts in December. Christmas Eve, people say, oh, we're going to Sundance. And you're like, oh, God. Because um, you have about two weeks to clear everything. But, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of rushing to get things done when there's been a lot of waiting around. Even after COVID, there's been quite a lot of waiting around. But now... You know, there's going to be so many submissions for Sundance in September. So everybody's really, usually you get the deadlines are extended. You know, if you know ways in and everything, they extend for some things. But most people are thinking that everything's going to be, every slot's going to be taken really early. So it is becoming a mad rush already. Do you think there's all these people that just sit around and wait to spite us all and then, you know, tell us the day before on purpose? It's so the plan. No, that's not the case. <laughs> we just have last minute projects. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's funny. Oh, Matthew Wang, how's it going? Good to have you on stage. Hey, thanks so much. How, how have you been? What have you, how have you been? What are you working on these days? Yeah, I just finished up my uh, second music supervision job uh, ever, which was a lot of fun. Cool, man. Very cool. Yeah, it was really. Um, Interesting. I don't know. I always assume like music supervision uh, might not be the thing for me, but it's uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, for everyone here who uh, doesn't know me, I'm mostly a composer. But um, yeah, I, I figured there's no reason to not try to be a composer and music supervisor if the job came up. So uh, yeah, that is. I'm I'm Matthew. I'm almost in the exact same place i took a music supervision job recently for a bet show because i know the composer and he, he needed help and it's not something i was looking for but it's actually pretty cool and um i i don't i i i made the i don't know if it was a mistake but i posted a brief for the first time on to three private not too large but private facebook groups and by the end of the day my, i had like over a hundred submissions and i don't think i've ever really been able to relate to what a lot of our guests have talked about with the email overload until like that moment so i don't know if you've seen that or if you've had to have to post or anything brief. As, as soon as i announced like hey i did my first music supervision job send me some tunes i started getting emails from completely random people with just like a soundcloud link nothing else in the email or just like people like <laughs> sending music as attachments and i've never hated life more but this one. <laughs> but Eric, was the music you got sent all of a high quality? Because, I mean, the thing is, if you get sent a lot of music that's good, it's fantastic. But if if there hasn't been any quality control, it's really difficult because you're like, oh, my God, you know. Fortunately, the groups were a little selective for mine. And so and I know some of the composers in there. And so 
I haven't even been able to go through all of them. I, like I, this literally was like three days ago, and I pro I I've gone through maybe five or six or seven out of the hundred emails that I've that I've or uh, messages that I've gotten. But I did go to the ones where I knew the person, I knew they were in sync, and I knew that they did you know hip hop or the genre I was looking for, and I went right to that first but i'm also a musician and a producer so i'm committed to kind of going looking through everybody's but it is very overwhelming i will say that bar that, right like, there you can visually see when like someone put in the effort like i feel like it's rare that like someone would just like throw a song in an email with like no subject and it's like amazing you know like i feel like the people who put in the work to like make really good music also generally put in work to like make it look good in the email or like say a bit about themselves and really excel themselves but just generally at least totally agree i feel like that that's a whole cheat code right there like it's a, a real life example of everything we kind of talk about when it comes to you know pitching your music to supervisors it's just like the headache that it can be just to get no context of an email with, you know no thought put into it and then on the other side those who take the time to do it and have their ducks in a row kind of you know cut above the noise and wait till you start getting the emails tomorrow from 95 of them checking to see if you liked what they sent you and then they do it again and you feel really bad because you you know you love music and you want to be you don't want to be an asshole you want to listen to stuff but it's really important you learn quite quickly to um make sure the music that's coming to you is all sorted out properly because then it's a joy to get 100 tracks when you're in trouble, I tell you. That is, that's a really good point. Yeah, the, I got a couple of emails from people like two days afterwards saying, hey, just want to see if you got the email. And it's so much that I wasn't even able to respond to say, hey, well, I, you know, I might have shot them a quick thing, but for most of them, I just kind of like keep them in the queue and say, okay, I'm going to go through these. But then it made me realize, you know, being on the other side, how how the person sending it out doesn't realize that they're being that they're that that there's a hundred other emails around them. They just see I sent you an email. It's digital. You should have got it right away. Why has it been two days later and I haven't heard anything, or you know, got some kind of acknowledgement? And so, and the tune is their baby as well. You got to remember that they love that tune and it could be amazing. So it's they're really excited for you to hear it too. Problem is, you get hundreds of emails. So, yeah, I can imagine like you know, Atik and um, you know, I know Steph and you know, you all, those of you who do this all the time, I can imagine what your inboxes look like. I have twenty two hundred unread emails in my inbox alone. I totally believe that. It's just insane. Yes, yeah, I seen you post that, Eric, in the group and. I, I had sent you over a link and then I said a prayer for you because I already knew <laughs> that they were going to bombard you. <laughs> for real, for real. But that also goes to relationship because as soon as I saw Clint, I'm like, oh, Clint does hip hop and he already knows this and he knows business. And so I, that, I, that, that went to the top of the list. And, I, you know, and while I haven't even listened to the music yet, I it responded to it. I put it in the queue. That's like, it's right there. And so like I think relationship the relationship and having some already um, something where the person knows that you have a track record and a track history that um, that that counts for a lot. Thank you. I appreciate you too for taking the time. And again, I appreciate the opportunity, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Laurel, has, I see you flashing down there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I feel like I'm so impressed by how patient you guys are with vetting and going through these things as well as you can but i do think there's something like if you're if you're really going to break through that that branding and presentation is everything that's going to catch someone's eye like way quicker than an email with no subject line preach <laughs> i mean i don't i don't even understand that like why someone would that just sort of gives you a, a little bit of insight of the kind of person they I don't want to say, I don't want to judge someone, but it's like, oh, that's sort of half-assed. <laughs> so I don't know. I, whenever I'm, I'm sharing or, you know, talking to a music soup or whomever, whatever, it's like, you know, you share the whole thing. Cause I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't get connected to something unless I see like a full picture. Right. Mm, that's good. 
Totally, totally true. I think I've some I've came to a realization even before this, just in general, and for my own self too. Creating music is such an isolated thing that for most of our careers, we're just measuring ourselves against ourselves. I mean, we might have references that we're measuring with, but the bar that we have is like a bar that we set for ourselves. And so, if someone has a song they feel like, I know this is good. It should get a response. I should get the gig. It's not entitlement. It's just um, an expectation based on our our isolation. And we don't really understand competition in this. It's not like football or, you know, um, other fields where you know you're going against somebody else for that same gig. Most of the people who sent the brief to me don't re- don't even think that there are a hundred other emails in there. They only know they've got the song, they've got the great music. It's perfect for this. Why why can't they get it? Wow, that's fascinating to me. Um, I know when you know some of the music houses, like you know someone like Stuff or walker or south or like you know there's they're all they're all bidding for jobs they're all trying to get the jobs and the artists are creating the music that's you know that they're bringing in to create the music there's so much competition um uh, yeah i'm 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 I'm, that that freedom of thought that you're talking about is pretty that's incredible it's powerful yeah uh, actually doing work with steph and like getting more into the the custom side and bespoke side, I think is part of the realization because that's the world that you guys live in all the time. But I think just as a producer, you know, whether you're pitching through libraries or whether you're doing beats for artists or whether you're doing other stuff, a lot of people aren't in that comp competitive mode and they don't necessarily, even if you're trying to pitch for, you know, Rihanna's song, it doesn't really grasp that, I'm competing against a million other people for that same placement. You really think the only thing that matters is if you have the the goods. I think the more that we're in this business, I feel like we don't really use the word, and you've heard me kind of say this on our calls too, we don't really love the competition word, even though it's a, I guess it's a totally real thing. I, right. I feel like there's so much, um, there's so much, um, work for everybody you know there's so many different types of work different styles of work there's kind of a music that fits everybody i think eric is right it's really about if you can hack it it really comes down to that you know and then everything else you know improves your chances and improves your odds but you know eventually you win a job if you're doing it right totally totally agree okay i want to shift focus um this is great great discussions um we do this this is what we do on wednesdays we kind of have um different discussions we'll either talk about things that are kind of around sync one-on-one topics like learning about sync or we'll talk about some of the trends in the industry kind of what's in the news and how it affects each of us in our jobs whether we're composers or um, songwriters or supervisors or executives or what have you publishers etc And so um, I always try to keep um, just some thoughts on what's going on kind of in the world. Oh, I see Lauren and Carter are both here. Um, How are you doing, Lauren? Hey, Eric. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Jiraj, Steph, how are you? Hey, Lauren. Hey, Carter. What's going on, fellas? How are you guys doing? Sorry to be late to the game, but I was working. <clears throat> but every time I see Steph ping me for one of these things, it's like a bat signal. <laughs> <laughs> can't talk now. I got to get the control. Can't. That is awesome. Um, so yeah. Um, so we've I've got some some different topics that um, I kind of will toss out, and you know if you have some insights or thoughts, um, then we'll toss them around, and if not, we'll move on to a, another thing. But these always tend to be kind of. Um, uh, interesting. So this first thing I want to talk about is uh, um, we, we've got an uh, NFL guy on the stage, but actually I want to talk about the NHL, the National Hockey League. National Hockey League is leaning into hip hop, uh, which is interesting because, you know, their history is more rock music when they've done anything. But they I saw a news clip this week that they're partnering with Timberland's Beat Club, um, which is also um, he's not here, but um one of our members actually um, works really heavily with that. 
Darash, who am I thinking of? Why can't I think of his name? Oh, Gil Flo. Um, works really heavily with uh, Beat Club. Anyway, and it's, this Beat Club is Timbaland's kind of music service, um, like a music marketplace, but they also kind of do a thing where they work with brands. And so they're partnering with the NHL to provide um, original songs, exclusives. And I find this interesting because, you know, Timbaland, Beat Club, there's a very strong kind of hip-hop side to that. And the NHL, NHL's history has been anything but on a side note is a, a they were actually in the news a lot this week because they're also partnering with clubhouse to bring like exclusive conversations to hockey fans on the app and so they've got a, a number of different um music or a number of different marketing related uh activities but specifically around this and hip-hop i'm just curious in terms of you know if they're doing more in the space has anyone seen anything that they're able to talk about um, is any well, they come across their desk or any activity uh, with NHL and uh, some because it seems like they're doing a lot in them trying to or trying to do a lot trying to or get younger younger fans trying to uh, get more activity in the states here and they're trying to use music uh, and sp- especially hip hop to do that. So anybody seeing anything or any thoughts on this? I Where's actually. Bo- oh, go ahead, Kiwichi. Oh, I was just gonna say, where's Bo? Like, wasn't he just doing all the like Stanley Cup performance craziness? Oh, that is true. I would love to. You're right. Yeah. And that's exactly what this is part part of too. Just the whole hip hop. I that's I, I didn't realize that was Bo. That's dope. I'm actually working on a entertainment uh, content project that I'm not allowed to talk about. That I can tell you it is with the NHL, and uh, without getting too deep into my NDAs, um, I can say that they are, it's not a, um, you're hundred percent right, Eric. They are definitely making a play to try and attract, uh, fans that are both women and BIPOC. Uh, basically anybody hockey is a predominantly male, predominantly white, um, rich suburban support, sport, uh, that they're aware of. And they are making a deep play into, trying to expand that and they did a project with snoop and a couple of other things so they are definitely uh trying to uh you know play in that direction that's not in your mind that is 100 percent happening not just in hip-hop but in actual content as well and, and content adjacent stuff they should probably start with integrating their teams a little bit more than uh, than they have right now. <laughs> i would love to comment on all of that but because i'm involved <laughs> Believe me, I'll tell you, I, I'm having the conversation offline because you guys know how passionate I am on the subject. So know that I am advocating across the board for all the things. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I'm actually, um, one of my songs is, is getting used in the, in, in the NHL spot as well. Um, and that's how I actually came across this whole relationship. But I know speaking with um their team as far as the B club team and stuff. And they were just mentioning just how in the NHL, like kind of the locker rooms, like what they are listening to kind of getting ready for games is hip hop. You know what I mean? And so trying to bring, I think some of that to, you know, the broader, I guess, conversation of what, you know, the, the NHL could look and sound like it was very interesting. Cause like, for me, I don't, you know, I, I don't think hip hop when I think NHL, but I think they're trying to, you know, rebrand, I guess, what could be their underlying, um, you know, with, you know, with the players are kind of consuming as well. And, you know, pop culture is, um, you know, a lot of, you know, pop culture kind of, you know, gets influenced by hip hop, you know, as well. So it's, it's an interesting, it's interesting to see that, that shift kind of happen in, um, in the sport. That is awesome. Just, it's so cool. Diraj, Vogue, Gilflo, like the people that are control camp related and Steph, uh, you know, uh, all um, part of this. And I wasn't aware of that when I was, you know, looking at them. I think actually um, Daraj had sent me um, the link to the article, but I didn't um, realize we had all these connections in here. So that, that's actually really, really cool. Okay. Um, let's move on to something else. Um, let's talk about Kanye West. Um this was from my, <laughs> I love that. This, my transition smoothness is great. That was awesome. <laughs> um, 
So this this is a discussion I was having earlier with uh and talking about Kanye West and just hip hop. We've t- been talking about hip hop and sync a lot. Like there's a lot more um, briefs coming out looking for hip hop. And um, I am wondering at what point might Kanye West um, mute Kanye West have kind of a black keys moment. And so I'm going to set this up a little bit. So bear with me. Right. So Kanye West, Yeezus, the, the Yeezus album was released 2013, right? And that included Black Skinhead. And Black Skinhead's kind of become, at least in my opinion, kind of like the prototype for uh, hip hop in a lot of like trailers and promos. Like that's the sound that those toms are doom, do doom, do doom, do captain. Like that's like that's become uh, a typical sound. And you hear lots and lots and lots of whether you want to call them sound alikes or influenced by or um, things where that sound is amused. Like that's that's the that's the prototype. And so it makes me we were having a discussion earlier wondering is at some point could this run into the same a similar problem where the black keys did so the black keys they had the album brothers uh, released around 2010 and it had this really unique sound because it had these kind of simplified rock arrangements but everything was distorted and the vocals were distorted and this really cool coloration on everything and that became like the in-demand sound for alt rock briefs i mean you still see it now i still see them come across my desk now but really like 2010, 2011, 2013, 2014, you know, the, that it was like everywhere, you know, um, it made me uh, create a alt rock group with another um, producer out of um, Austria. We did a whole EP that EP, we still get placements off of that. We've been in a couple of episodes of Shameless. We've been on a bunch of other TV shows like that. Just anything, it kind of influenced by that, that gritty, gritty, distorted sound. And so, but in 2012, 2013, uh, they sued, Black Keys sued Home Depot, they sued Pizza Hut, they sued um, Pinnacle Entertainment, which is like this casino developer. They, they sued them for commissioning soundalikes from their songs. You know, they, and this, the case actually said that they used the songs, but it was really seems to be based off of the fact that they commissioned soundalikes. And they also sued one of the production houses that actually created the soundalike for the Pinnacle Entertainment um, brief. And so after that point, you know, you started seeing a lot of production houses kind of change their language and, you know, in their, their briefs, they may have included Black Keys as a reference, but everybody kind of moved away from the words sound alikes. And um, um, I started, I had some of the songs that got placed or even in the same group, Mama's Basement is one of the groups that um, I used to, to do the sound. Some of the songs we submitted started getting rejected by certain libraries because they now they were more worried about things being too close or too, you know, in the vein and really were going to hold the line more on things being original. So my, my question to the room now is, is this has not become an issue as far as I know, but if you listen to a playlist of like... Um, kind of promo type hip hop, you know, there's, is this something that could be a problem? Has anybody seen anything that indicates it might be a problem? Is anybody seeing any yellow or red flags about this with Kanye's black skinhead being so such a prolific sound with within hip hop? Or, you know, is are these totally different situations from your perspective? I want to hear what the room thinks. Any thoughts from anyone? Can I just ask you, do you know if the lawsuit was won against the Soundhouse? Um, I don't know about the Soundhouse. Pinnacle settled. And I think, um, I think Home Depot, I know Pinnacle definitely settled. And I think Home Depot and Pizza Hut did. But I don't know about the sound, about the production house. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Just, just, I'm sorry, one second. Sorry, my, 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 my kid just came and like stood in the door like, can I talk to you? And I was like, <laughs> Zach, second. just one second. But I, I, I think this is one of those things where um, the Black Keys style was a little more easy. It was easier to imitate or duplicate than the Black Skinhead thing. 
So I use Black Skinhead as um, as an example when I'm talking to artists about sync material. And one of the things I say about it is nobody wants to hear the 98 cent version of Black Skinhead, right? Because nobody does. Um, whereas the 98 cent version of the Black Keys, you can kind of get away with. Get some whoa woes and some claps going and you might be all right, you know? Um, in fact, you will be all right. That happens all the time. But with the black skinhead thing, it's really tough because hip hop does not necessarily lend itself to sync in its organic, natural form the way rock does. Rock, you can sometimes put pull an instrumental and there'll be a guitar solo and stuff like that. Hip hop, you usually pull the vocal out and you've really got four, be four measures that are repeating themselves. OK, so it just sort of sits there. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's hard, perfectly. It's hard. Okay, sorry, it's hard. It's hard when you get no feedback. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's it's one of those things where I think the the, the that the, the thing that that brief we've all seen where basically swagger is French for make a sound like black keys. You know, there's that thing that happens, but you can't really pull that off so much with black skinhead. But the thing about black skinhead that is amazing is if you listen to the track itself. It's almost like no two measures are the same. Something is always happening. And that's necessary in any sync music in order to propel against the narrative. You can't sit there. You can't just repeat things over and over again. Um, and you have to either have a melody or something special happening, dropouts, changes, and think of all the different sections that exist in, in Black Skinhead. Right. That's something that is harder to pay attention to than Oh, 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 you know, you, you know, it's just harder to, to duplicate the audience effect of Black Skinhead, which has so many different changes uh, and so many different moments. Um, I think that that may be one of the reasons why there hasn't been a Black Keys lawsuit moment with Black Skinhead, because you can't get you can't get that close. You can't make it sound as much alike as you can with the Black Keys. That's a great analysis, Carl. I appreciate that. Laurel, I see your um, mic open. Yeah, I, I I just have to give Carter props because he nailed it. I mean, I'm actually surprised, and, and I love the Black Keys, but, you know, they're tapping into, you know, House of the Rising Sun. Like, they tap into public domain area, you know? And with that... And the, the difference between, you know, the complete inventiveness happening within the hip hop and pop realm. I mean, it's it's it will be very hard to to get into that. So, Carter, I just want to give you props, really. <laughs> I'm saying the same. Uh, thing. <laughs> I, I agree with you 100 percent, though. It is like, you know, it's a shining example of musical progress and um, the Black Keys. You're right. It's just something different. Totally. That's. That's such an interesting perspective too, Carter. Because like, it's it's like I, I hear you say that, and then on the other side, I feel like I hear a lot of people like mimicking the the black skinhead vibe in the sync space. I feel like if you're doing hip hop like in this space, you at least need one song that kind of feels like the black skinhead vibe. Hey, just hey. in the in the I canon. Got you know what I mean? Right, like, right, you keep, right. You keep doing it too, but, uh, but it's a but, lot. It's a lot more difficult, and I don't think a lot of those things. Plenty of them do go to finish, you know, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's just, it's not as versatile and there aren't as many that do the job. The, the ones that we're used to hearing that are promos for all kinds of wonderful shows on the CW, uh, Applebee's, uh, truck commercials, beer commercials, uh, any number of sports themed things that, that are relying on the Black Keys thing what you get with the black skinhead thing is people want that. It's just so much harder for it to be emulated. And, that they and, don't like to go to finish. Is all yeah. Good. And I think was, was dope about what, and, and I, I think too, like speaking from the creative and like, as far as for me, like I've heard um, different flavors of, you know, attempts at the black skinhead um, and you see it come up a lot. And then, I, and, I, and I'm curious to hear, like, you know, some of the other execs and music supervisors as far as if they're feeling tired of, you know, e either 
uh, replications of it or, you know, sound alikes or whatever, because I've even gotten to the place of like, I, I think like one of the cool takeaways from the black, black skin hair, I think what we've been talking about is just the fact that it's probably one of the, like those hip hop tracks that actually like wasn't as repetitive because hip hop's like foundation is off of like sample based loops, you know what I mean? Like a, a repetition and it's all kind of about a, a swag, a vibe, a feel, you know what I mean? Where it, it doesn't always, not to say this is true for all hip hop, but um, it, it's not the same dynamics. I think it's, you know, other genres of music. Um, it, it probably is more so now, like different, you know, different flavors, different artists, because, you know, hip hop is just kind of gone so many different places, so many crossovers, you know, with it. But I think it's cool to see like, and, and I feel like I've heard it before too, it's just like, what even what Carter was expressing, like this is like one of the first times I've ever seen like this is hip hop that seems, you know, syncable, like it moves, you know what I mean? Like it has dynamics. And I feel like, like for me now, as I'm going and creating more stuff, like I'm taking that, um, I'm taking that kind of approach now, where it's just like, how can I do something that feels, that has the movement that, you know, this black skinhead is, is doing, you know, for sync. Um, but it just feels different because even like for myself, like, all right, I see a lot of people run into this sound. This is what, like, what's, what is the next thing? Is there a next thing um, kind of in the hip hop space that still works really good for picture um, and so on and so forth? So the, it's interesting. I, I think another funny thing, too, is like maybe I haven't seen lawsuits for, for this stuff is Kanye sample everybody. So people sampling his stuff now. <laughs> This is great. Uh, all right, let's take a, a break. Oh, Lauren, I see you flashing. Yeah, thanks. I just I think this is a this is a conversation that reminds me of um, when I was producing music for commercials, and you know the editor would put a track, uh, you know, against the picture from a, a well known artist, and it, many times it was hip hop, or many times it was something else, and you know the the spot would work its way up through various levels of approvals internally with the client and then they discover they don't have the money to license that music so they say okay well let's do something like that so then you know you have to sort of create a derivative version of a track that's well known and then you know you have to run it by a forensic musicologist to make sure that it's you know, that's close, far enough away that you're not going to attract a call from an attorney on the other side. But I think it's the point I'm making is, you know, you either have to go with an original thing, original idea, or license that piece of music. It's, you know, when, when you start making derivative pieces, then no one's happy. And, um, you know, so it's, it's kind of you have to be, really go each way, either way, license the track you love, or create your own thing and, you know, and love it, love what you make. That's a, I was just going to say, that's a really good point, Lauren. It's, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like what Yoda said, you know, you, you, or no, maybe it was Mr. Miyagi, you know, you either do it, there's no try, you're either doing it or you're not doing it. And um, emulating something, especially a well-known piece of music is very difficult because there's all the cultural shorthand that goes with something. And I'm sure you've been in this situation, Lauren, I know that I have, where you actually had to talk to the studio uh, as a rep as uh, from the buy side, and just be like, we're not going to beat it. We're not going to beat when the levy breaks in Argo. We're just not going to beat it. I'm going to give you all the songs you want. You're not going to beat them. You know, you're not going to beat it. It just it happens. And there are certain things that are unquantifiable benefits from certain pieces of music that you'll never duplicate and in that case when you cannot afford the led zeppelin which most people cannot um then you have to decide what is it doing for the audience what is the, the what's the effect on that it's having on the audience and how can we duplicate that effect rather than how can we make a song that sounds like this because that's actually the wrong question to ask it's the wrong handle to pick it up with you want to pick it up with the handle that says what's it doing to the audience i also I point. before you um just lastly i also think that 
um, thought that just came to me. I think creatively, in terms of sync in hip hop, we really haven't like we really haven't seen the peak of our creativity because up until this point, you know, um, TV, film, movies, advertising, and hip hop as a genre is just really kind of you know getting acts breaking in this. What we for the stuff that's happened. I mean, Kanye took some liberties for. It as as a the amazing producer that he is and introduced that and the industry kind of took to that sound but as you get more like artists like you know Vo and Daraj and you know people who are like you know what I'm going all in. I'm making music with sync in mind and I'm bringing all my community all my creativity into this space I mean as as you have people who work with advertising companies and production companies and these creative minds are now in this business more you're going to that you're going to get so much more creativity like I don't think the industry has even seen what that what hip-hop is going to bring to it we're just recycling or using the throwaways from what was created for the major industry so it'll be totally incredible as as now that this industry is opening up to this and the more it opens up and the creatives are like oh I can really like put bring all of me into this it'll it'll be really amazing to see yeah i I, I, i'm gonna do a real quick reset and um i think maybe we're probably going to transition to a um, q a with our audience but this is a really really good uh conversation um so real quick good evening welcome everybody to control camp Uh, we are community built for and by independent artists i'm one of your hosts Raj, alongside me uh, are my co-hosts Eric Campbell and Steph Inc., who had to step away, but um, she may be back a little later. I uh, appreciate you joining us. We host rooms every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, where we interview industry guests, talk about how you can get your music into TV and film. So get to know more about us and all the resources we have available over at controlcamp.com. And uh, if you haven't already, be sure to tap the greenhouse at the top and follow our club to be notified for every new room uh, that we host. And um, and just also a heads up, there'll be a members only after party right after um, our uh, Wednesday room here. Uh, we end in about, about, we got about 45 minutes left. Um, so after this room, it'll be the after party. So you'll only see that room if you are uh, following the camp. So make sure, uh, again, you tap the greenhouse and, and give us a follow and uh, yeah, I don't want to prolong too much. We've been having a really engaged conversation. These are our campfire convos where uh, we just like to discuss news in the world of sync. Um, any questions you might have um, in regards to sync and uh, how to get your music uh, in this side of the industry. And so with that said, we want to go ahead and I believe we're ready to open up for hand raising and just pull people up. If you have a question. Um, just in regards to the topic at hand or just in, uh, in, in relation to, you know, your music and sync licensing, how to get started, um, all of the above, uh, we, we set aside that time for this. So, uh, Eric, I'm going to swing it back over to you and I'll open up hand raising for everyone. Well, I turned the hand raising on already. Um, I did see Andy flash. Andy, were you trying to say something? Yeah, I don't want to disrupt this at all. I just wanted to quickly bring your attention to, I don't know if you heard about the Olivia Rodrigo Elvis Costello uh, copyright thing that happened in the last couple of days. Some fans of uh, Elvis Costello flagged that she had a guitar riff that was very similar to his Pump It Up song. He then came out and said, this is fine by me. This is how rock and roll works. You take the broken pieces of another thrill and make a brand new toy. That's what I did. And he said, he's famous for saying, actually, Elvis Costello, that he's never written a song in his life. He's just rewritten thousands. And he and I love him. And he said, wow. he said that he borrowed his riff for Pump It Up from Bob Dylan's Subterranean Homesick Blues, which in itself was inspired by Chuck Berry's Too Much Monkey Business. So that was a fascinating... I don't know what the publishers are going to say about that, but Elvis <laughs> Costello has said, this is fine. As a publisher, I'll just say there's only 12 notes. Yeah, but that riff, if you compare the two, they're pretty identical. I mean, they are. But there are, the, the, you know, there is, there's a thing called a contrafact in 
jazz and classical where you can pay homage to a piece of music. So I don't know, it'll be an interesting one to follow because the songwriter has said he doesn't care. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, it will be interesting to see how the, what the line the publishers take. Laurel, let's see your mic open. Oh man, I just have to, I have to say, I feel for Olivia Rodrigo because she also just got attacked by Courtney Love for stealing her album cover. <laughs> so, I did not hear that. Oh, wow. Damn. Yeah, if you look it up, you'll see it. She, it, it, I just, you know, she's young. I mean, she has people guiding her, but she's, you know, what, nineteen, something like that. So. Yeah, just anyway, I, I feel for her. A lot of a lot of people coming at, you know, you got this from me, but like everyone said, most things have been done before. But I think Elvis is actually sticking up for her and helping her and saying he's yeah. honored, honored, and I think that's really great of him because he's oh. he's backing another artist, really. Hundred percent. Yes. No. Yeah, I, I was talking about the fans. Elvis is a completely elegant human being, and I, I love. Love hearing that he backs her because I think she's pretty talented. And her song is really good. And it is, she has created something really good. And if you're going to take from someone, cool person to take from. <laughs> so true. I can't imagine that didn't come up somewhere along the way during the production of that song. Someone didn't mention that. I, I find that would be very hard to believe. Yeah, interpolation. I mean, anytime an artist I work with is making a record, all of our labels go through, you know, go through it with a fine tooth comb. Because if you, if something gets through and you've pressed vinyl, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to be a really expensive fix if you don't go through all that. Very true. Very good points. Okay, let's jump into some questions. Uh, we got a couple people on stage. If anyone has a question as to something that was that we've already discussed, or if you got a Sync 101 question, just want to ask of the panel. Uh, we do uh, one question, no follow up. So uh, what we normally do just to keep things moving, uh, you'll ask your question, and then we'll put you back into the um, audience um, and you can hear the answer there if any for any reason we need to bring you back for follow-up uh, if, if somebody on stage has a follow-up we'll pull you back up but that'll just help us keep uh, things moving uh, and with that we will start with uh, you Eric how's it going hey how's it going um, love in the room is always it's always such a great conversations in this room um, so I've recently started as a uh, sync licensing agent, uh, uh, finally on my path to become to go to, to get into music supervision. Um, long story short, my question is, uh, what uh, advice do you guys have in regards to uh, talking to a music supervisor if you're a sync licensor, trying to you know pitch uh, a library or a song or a playlist? When you say talking to them, do you mean like how do you? find them or what do you how, how do you construct your emails what do you mean when you say talking to them um you know just general etiquette you know do's and don'ts kind of um you know yes also constructing an email uh finding them not so much uh, you know that's fine but well let me ask andy since on stage i'll put andy on the spot like would you have advice for like how for some an agent or a rep someone who represents music that you don't know how do you like to be reached out to andy I think you've got, I always tell people, you've got to try and, um, you've got to try and stand out like anybody and, and make your email stand out because we do get a lot of emails. So for me, it's very genre specific. You know, if you have a lot of, um, house music or I don't know, you always use Afro punk or something, or if you have whatever the genres of music are, put those in your email because what I often do is I always try and add new people to sort of freshen up the sink houses that I go out to. And I always try and add new people, you know, every couple of months, just try another one out and everything, see if I can expand. But what I often do when I'm looking for music is I'll Google in my email, you know, Afrobeat or something. And then lo and behold, suddenly a couple of things come up saying, oh, 100% controlled, blah, blah, blah. And then I contact the people and, get in touch with them. Other than that, it's similar to artists approaching. It's very difficult with the volume of stuff we get sent all the time. You've got to remember as well, majors are sending us stuff, publishers and record labels as well all the time. So we get so much stuff. So really, 
if you can make a personal, if you can meet someone and then they say, and say, I'm going to send you it, can you try and check it out? Then that is a good way because, again, we're only human and we do want to receive music, um, if possible, good music. We want it to be easy. Um, so if you can meet someone and then send it, do that. But I would say, for me, it really is genres. And I know we all hate genres, but it is really important for, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's pop or if it's indie rock or something, it's important to know. Okay, so that's probably the best advice I can give. Thank you so much, Andy. I see you, Carter. Okay, so yeah, you know, I'm going to just jump on what my man Andy just said. And hi, Andy. Uh, hi. That, <laughs> that, uh, that you need to put something on your spine, uh, like you're a book in a library. Be very conscientious about how you label what you're doing, because as Andy points out, music supervisors and people on the buy side, they need it more than you want to sell it, to be totally honest with you. So if they can easily go back and find you for their search that says, I want it to sound like black skinhead or black keys, black, uh, 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 it's like they need to know what you are at, 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 a, at a quick glance. And then the other thing I would, I would point out to you, Eric, is that you want to respond with things that will actually work. This is the, this is the production's agenda. This is the music supervisor's agenda. This is not your agenda. So if you have something that you think might kind of maybe could work and my mom likes the song, don't send it. Get three legs on that stool. If they're asking for female vocal, 80s sounding uh, with uh, guitar, well, make sure that all three of those things are in whatever you have to send. And if you don't have it, don't send it. That's it. Oh my God, Carter. I love what you just said. <laughs> I don't think we've really talked about um, nailing the brief, you know, really editing yourself and really knowing exactly what you're send sending and validating. You know, we talked very early on, I think, E. Diraj, about your songs. I think validating your songs for brief too are also really important. If you're unsure, you can also send it to other, especially in this room, you have a lot of allies, right? There's a lot of people that know sync and are getting into sync or have, you know, just give you other ears to listen to. If you're unsure, if it a hundred percent meets that litmus test, then, you know, ask some friends, phone a friend, as they say. So good. Um, just one last thing for you, Eric and the audience. Um, on our website, controlcamp.com, there's a Sync 101 page. And on that Sync 101 page, there is an ebook called Seven Rules on How to Engage Music Supervisors. This is really the same thing whether you are a composer or in an agency. If you're trying to reach someone um, and trying to, to you know, just to get someone to know you, there's some some good things that you should know that's you know different than just you know sending cold emails or sending generic emails that get ignored especially when, when we're talking about like we did earlier that a lot of us might get 100 messages in our box so go to the site and check that out and see if uh that'll give you some additional um insight all right we got a question we got rachel on the stage hey rachel Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my question is mainly for Eric and Diraj. I just want to give a big shout to my friends in the room. I get to ask you all questions all day, I think it seems like. So uh, Eric and Diraj, uh, Musicians Peer Support is launching our Patreon tomorrow. You all have been super successful in building your community. I'm just wondering, you've been such an influence and inspiration to us all. Any words of advice? on building the patreon or building the community just in general i mean you you guys are are forging ahead you're helping indie artists you're you know you're you're really doing uh doing what we're passionate about helping people get get to that next level try to feed through some misinformation sharing resources you know you're, you're kind of an expert at, at building community and and uh, helping indie artists out and you have a patreon so yeah i'm just wondering if you have any kind of uh, words of advice for, for a, you know, a woman business owner about to launch a, a business tomorrow in the music industry as uh, somebody who's also a community builder like you all. 
Oh, that's awesome, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, and you're, I mean, you're, you're, you are uh, an influence as well, and we're all familiar, with, like, with your room here, and just, the, I, th- I think that it's cool that you set up a unique space that's focused on kind of music and our, um, our health, and so you know, I think just like sync is our unique voice, you've kind of found a unique voice, and if you put out a unique voice, that's how you kind of get the community. So kudos to you for it for um doing that and so um i let the raj jump in because he kind of set up our patreon and he's more familiar with that so if he has partic- particular tips on that um i'll pass it to him yeah no i'm super super excited for all that you've been building rachel and, and continue to build um i mean for us i think consistency has probably been the biggest thing um you know, trying to, I feel like a lot of, you know, what I will say is kind of been said is, you know, is, is how do, how are we adding value and like identifying where the need is and trying to speak to it. You know, when we first came on the clubhouse, it was purely out of like the, the heart of like, how can we kind of give back, you know, what we've been given because we just, you know, saw so much wealth and what, sync was for our you know music careers um it was an opportunity for us to continue to learn and meet people um as well as give back and you know from that we've you know garnered this community you know we met steph who's amazing like you know like you know it's, it's a lot of things that's just you know we couldn't have planned for but i know one of the things that we've you know continue to do is just keep showing up you know, we meet often, you know, behind the scenes, we're, you know, really structured and, you know, we try to plan out our rooms and um, invite other voices into the mix to, you know, try to make this thing, you know, better because, you know, we are peer led, you know, we are you all, you know what I mean? Like we're not above, you know, anybody. We, um, you know, just try to extend out and, and bring in as many as we can so that we can all grow together. Um, and then with the Patreon, I think, you know, some practical things is, you know, we have, uh, you know, some offerings that, you know, allow us to, um, you know, stay connected with our uh, community, even off of Clubhouse. So we send out emails and, um, you know, we uh, remind people about our Patreon and, you know, we hope to have something that is useful for them at the end of the day. So. Uh, those are a few things that come to mind. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so team. much. I just want to thank you, Eric Diraj and Steph also for being so enthusiastic about supporting us and congrats to all your successes as well. Thank you, Rachel. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Good luck. That's thank awesome. you, Steph. Love you. So nice to see you again. <laughs> nice to see you too. You know, I, I think you brought up a really good point um eric which is you know have a perspective and have your unique voice and that kind of leads back to what andy was saying about music your unique voice and music there's a lot of really incredible talented whatever the word i I hate the word talent it's just ability and all the things that come that we disguise as the word talent um there's so much of it in the universe there's a ton of it um what makes you unique you know what what cuts you above the rest is really what it is and sometimes it's not even musical sometimes it's an authentic human which i think speaks to rachel's room and also speaks to how you know people are successful in this business i I find that there's three type three buckets of people unfortunately there's going to be agreeing agreeing disagreeing on this stage i'm sure with what i'm about to say in my experience there is the bucket of people who are in the artist path who get successful in sync because they're amazing artists and they're front facing artists and they're touring and they have amazing teams and managers or they just did the whole kind of artist label uh indie whatever path but they're doing a front face artist thing there are people who are super persistent um who are not even the best and not even the most talented but they're organized they're diligent and they're persistent, and some of them are assholes, pardon my New York French, um, but they're very persistent, and they get ahead in this business because persistence is really key. Uh, and a lot of really good people um, are, and Rachel Delgado, who was just in the room, has the musicians' peer support, which is something that's talked about often. It's hard to be persistent when you're getting, con- you know, you can feel constantly shut down. And, you know, Eric, Diraj, and I, and this a lot of this room, we've had topics before where, you know, you could be at the top of your game and the highs are really high and then the lows still 
feel really low because we're still a bunch of artists. <laughs> Atik runs a room called How Are You Doing? <laughs> you know, it's like you're we're still a bunch of, you know, artists and we're still a bunch of humans. And even if you, you know what it feels like to win and lose um, and the wins are really big and the losses are so equally balanced and big. So those are hard things. And a lot of people who are wonderful people who do deserve to people do, do deserve to be here, give up because it's just a, a tough path sometimes, you know? So persistence for better or worse is one of those. Um, and then, you know, I forgot my third bucket because I've derailed my train of thought, but <laughs> that's really what it comes down to, I think. You know, um, I wanted to toss this out to the room. You know, Diraj said, we do, we actually do a lot of preparation for these rooms. A lot of it comes from questions we get in our DMs quite frequently. And one of the ones that we, all figured out that we get the most is, you know, the basic question of how do I get started in sync? And we've answered the email question and the contact question, but I don't think we've talked about, you know, at least not recently, two major ways to get into sync. And one is collaboration. I think working with other writers, collaborating with people who have been in this business for a minute, even if it's someone who has placed a song, if you've placed no songs or if you've placed one song and they've placed one song, then you're, you know, your strength is in numbers um, because not only do you have different musical perspectives, which is always a better thing in my opinion, but you also have two different sets of people working that song and two different teams. You know, the larger you get, the more that kind of multiplies because as you get bigger and bigger, you have two different publishers and I'm sure the major publishers on the stage could also giggle and so would the uh, supervisors to say, oh, well, that could also work against you. <laughs> you know, nothing's a perfect system. But in a perfect world, you know, ideally, the more you collaborate and the more you, uh, you know, work in the community, the better you are. But I would love, you know, anybody on this stage, creator or supervisor, we all, I feel like at a certain, when you get to this level, rely on each other and rely on our communities to get stuff done in this business. Uh, does anybody want to speak to kind of best ways to get started and, you know, best ways to get stuff done and kind of build a network, really? Yeah, I can I can add to it. Um, I know for me getting started, um, honestly, I, I got introduced to sync through collaboration. Um, I was in college and someone found me on on MySpace and you know they seen that you know I played keys and he was just like yo like I'm working on stuff for TV and film you should actually look into it it's a really cool opportunity I was young I was just like dude I'm trying to be the next dark child like but okay we can we can collab and I'll play some keys on stuff and um you know that was kind of my introduction to that space and without that, you know, the, you know, Saturday sessions going to lay keys over, over his tracks, um, I probably would have completely ignored this opportunity and wouldn't have revisited, you know, a few years later when I matured a little bit and realized that there's more opportunities outside of just the, the handful of major artists that are working on projects. Um, so that was kind of my introduction. And then from there, um, I, I started looking into music libraries, um, companies who already had relationships established with music supervisors and, you know, uh, coordinators and things like that to where, you know, I could focus on making the music and, and kind of perfecting that skill and then let them handle, you know, the balancing of the relationships and things like that. And then once I kind of got, got my feet wet, got a little more experience, kind of seeing, you know, how deliverables work as far as you know, how, how they like to receive files, how they like music structured, metadata, all of that stuff. And once I got a grasp on that, then kind of started branching out and, and trying to reach out to, to music supervisors myself. Um, and then as I built more relationships with more companies, I circled back around to just collaboration because you re quickly realize that you can't do everything. And it's, it's a numbers game and you just there's no way one person is going to be able to to manage all of the requests and all of the music that's needed in these productions. So yeah, I, I agree with you, Steph, and, and just saying that collaboration is huge. And um, yeah, that's kind of how I got started. Well, let me reframe that question now that you said that, Clint. How many of you 
on this stage truly go it alone? I would, say, I would venture the answer is none. You know, I mean, can any of you speak to, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like professionally, I'm looking at our group knowing, you know, how many times uh, does a musician, especially, or a, you know, new composer come to you via a recommendation through a colleague or a friend or a colleague and a friend, someone who's both. In terms of discovery, how much do you discover on your own versus how much comes to you via other people? I'm, I'm happy to chime in there. Um, again, you know, I know we've talked, uh, uh, some people have brought up just, you know, the branding and identity of someone. I mean, not everybody's an artist and a composer, but the, the folks that I've connected with were artists. That's, that's primarily my, my world. Um, and these artists happen to be multidisciplinaries. And that's, I picked up on them based on them standing out as, as their brand, as their, you know, their artistry. And that really drove me in, you know, coming from, you know, I entered in through their artist face and discovered their ability to compose. And one artist, you know, entered into the world of score because he had a track that was licensed basically to almost every single episode of Scandal to the point where it became the sound of the show. <laughs> and it was like, well, we should just have this guy score stuff. So, uh, you know, that's that's how I've, I've connected with like actually seeing and experiencing something. It's come from an artist's personality and their their clear vision of who they are. Now, obviously that's only one way, but that's just adding that to the conversation. I see um, Carter and then Lauren. Oh, I'm sorry. I realized I was off mute. But I will say that um, I, I totally resonate with that. And by the way, it's, it's, it's the well-rounded artist that really can, can ride their own talent. So, you know, you're just pointing out that this guy kept, you know, this, 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 comp this writer, you guys kept licensing this thing. You were like, screw it. Let's just have him compose for the show. Uh, but it was also somebody who was like responsive, pleasant enough to spend time with organized, you know, it all, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's there, there's, there, it, it's gotta be everything uh, in order, you know, you want it to be as much as it can be. Uh, in order to make those sort of um, progressive steps. By the way, sorry, Lauren, let me, let me just say one thing about what Carter is saying. Um, Carter also had a client similar to what you were saying, Laurel, where he had a black violin who are, God, they're my favorite, um, who were not score guys. And, you know, Carter, if you don't mind me telling the story, you know, they, they were a little trepidatious when they got approached to do score and someone like Carter was smart enough around them to say, Hey, I know you haven't done this yet, but don't bow out of the gig, you know? So sometimes things are going to come to you in a specific way that you haven't yet tried. Diraj and I also had that recently yet, you know, we don't know what we don't know yet. Right. So be open is another uh, kind of really good point. You never know where your next kind of interesting job will come from. Here, here. Lauren, did you want to chime in on this? Yeah, I would just say briefly, like, uh, particularly during my many years of producing music for advertising and either working with individual composers or with production music companies, you, you know, many of the people that I, that I came to rely on and became part of my sort of, you know, chosen community of, um, of, composers and musicians you know including certain studio musicians that you'd want in the studio for a gig that were doing programming or guitar or something you know a lot of them just came from from recommendations from colleagues from being someplace and checking somebody out and discovering how good they were and what a cool person they were so it sort of evolves over time and um you know just you know, no one person can do it by themselves. That's, you can't, it's hard to be successful 
just doing it all on your own. I mean, many people are helping you. So just being open to these uh, introductions and open to checking people out, going to a club and hear somebody play and then discovering that, oh, yeah, they do a little writing and, oh, yes, they can score. And, wow, it's amazing. So it's, it's um, you know, it's a, it's a big sort of organic evolution and continuing process of, of being open to, uh, to checking people out. That's awesome. Andy, I saw your mic on. You want to chime in here? Yeah, I'd also say, I mean, I hear a lot of big songwriters say this, um, write songs with unknown people. And I'd say to pitch houses and everything, look for music supervisors that are starting out because they're gonna really need quality music and they're gonna love it if you have quality, easy music. Because I work with pitch houses that I've always worked with. I've worked with them for 15 years and I just know what I'm gonna get. That's why I deliberately try and add new people, not because I really need to, because I'm kind of getting what I need, but I add new people because I wanna keep, try and bring other people into my world but really try and go for up and comers because they're desperate for this music. And I've seen supervisors start out who have kind of, we've helped them and advised them and man, they're killing it now. Wish I had half the TV shows they have and they're brilliant. Andy, on that note, how would you advise someone to find supervisors who are just starting out? Well, you've got to look, you know, I tell people to watch just bits of shows all the time. If you're trying to get your music in a show, you don't have to watch the whole show, but watch a couple of episodes or an episode and look on TuneFind and see what songs they use and everything. And then just look on IMDb. I mean, IMDb Pro is really useful for people that are looking for things. You know, you've just got to do your homework. If you see a show and there's a supervisor that you realize has only done about four or five shows, then they're on the way up and go for it, you know? I mean, I don't think there's an easy way, but there's no easy way for any of this. None of us have had it easy. It's all, it's all networking, being, as Carter said, pleasant to work with, you know, and professional. But being professional is doing your homework. So look around, go on IMDb Pro and see if there are music supervisors that are like a million. If you're on IMDb Pro, you'll know what number they are and the sort of thing. And then you can see that they haven't done many shows. That's what I would do. That is um, awesome advice. Sorry, Eric. And make, Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, add on to Andy's point. If you really love like a sync that someone did on a show, and you just mentioned like, oh my God, the use of that song in this scene like of one of my favorite shows, incredible. Um, I happen to write music it's you know similar genre or something i would love to like you know uh, here's like a little sampler or something you know just like a little something to show you they've done the work there too because you don't need to say like or like write about every single song a person synced or, or try to even attempt that but if you genuinely did love a sync that they did and you put that in there it will make you stand out so much more totally one of the little tricks that we've dropped in here every once in a while, but we never really kind of extrapolate on is that um, music editors, music assistants, and music coordinators are also sometimes better ways than reaching out to supervisors. And I just had that validated with the Guild of Music Supervisors. Asked to make a list of some of the largest supervisors that we wanted to work with on this project. And when we did, you know, we weren't, things weren't moving as fast as, you know, we wanted them to. And someone from their team said, you know what? That's a bad idea. You know what we should do? That person's never going to respond. They're probably not going to read their email because they're not going to see it for another three weeks. We should just reach out to their assistant and then we'll get it in and then it'll be easy. And I was like, oh my God, I love this. And they made us a list of all of the people that we wanted assistants. <laughs> and then they went out to them for us, which I thought was super rad. So I really think assistants, coordinators, and people who are on the up and up, whoever said that, I think it was Andy or whoever, uh, maybe even Lauren, whoever said that first, that's the genius gem right there. Find people, don't go for, you know, Madonna or, or you know, the Andy or Atik, uh, you're on your first go perhaps, like look for whoever's assisting those people and, you know, try to, try to, I, I love Matthew, what you just said about, um, you know, it goes back to being a human and also just a little bit of, hey, 
I'm paying attention. I'm thoughtful about what you're doing too. And here's a little tiny bit, not 30 songs. Here's a little bit of tiny bit to show you that I did my homework, you know, short and sweet. I love that. We have a couple questions. Um, I think Jesse's up first. Thanks for waiting, Jesse. No worries. Actually, Eric asked Andy the question I was going to ask, so I'm good. And hi, everybody. Hey, hi. Jesse. Good to see you. <laughs> Me too. Cool. Thanks so much. Yeah, that. Um, uh, I, I thought we might, could, by the time you came up, I thought we might have the same question. So very, very cool. Also, let me just say to anyone in the audience, we're about to close hand raising in a few minutes. Um, but we, we started this thing last week where if anyone has any uh, wins or any full circle moments, maybe something you learned in control camp that you actually put into practice and you saw some results from it. We'd love to hear that as well in this room. So if anyone has questions or a win, like a sink or a deal or something uh, that they want to share or some full circle moment from something that they've learned in the room, we uh, would love to hear that as well. And while we're waiting, let's, uh, Jared, we got you up next. How's it going? Greetings, everyone. It's going well. Cool. What's your question? So it was just um, kind of touching on what Steph just said, actually. It was so... Uh, touching to me because at the end of the day, if we want to like reach like Madonna, the best thing is to like reach her team because at the end of the day, they have to schedule whatever it is she's going to do anyways. So you might as well go to them um, because they don't have as much stuff as Madonna has going on. So whatever, you know, just using Madonna for, for the uh, example, but at the end of the day, we have to go through those uh, quote unquote low lower you know under under the actual celebrity radar to get to whoever we want to get because we're gonna probably have to pass their way anyway so but also i don't want to gloss over the gem that andy said which i i we i it was that was news to me um which is this the thought of all right yes you know madonna and jen malone and all these people they're like they they have all these movie opportunities and yes they have a team and they have all these things but there's somebody out there who who is doing their third or fourth supervision gig and they don't have a team they don't have go-to people who might do the genre that they're looking for i did the post this i did the post this week because i know i don't have well i probably do now but i knew i didn't have enough hip-hop to get me through a whole season it was my first gig and i had enough to get through the first three episodes and then i'm like oh i'm kind of running out of i've reached out to all the people that i know i need to do something and and so if someone's on gig one two three or four they still probably need, they'll be more open to you reaching out to them. And so doing that research of finding those people, you know, somebody who's done one gig, that might be the one and only, but somebody who's on gig three or four, like Andy said, they're an up and coming. They're, they're, they, they got, they got some traction and they're moving. That's a great person to target. Oh my God. Totally, Eric. And on top of that, if you get in early with someone who's on their first or second or third film or for, you know, first TV show or any first project like that, and you can show that you're a huge asset to them, they'll keep you forever. If you are, you know, doing easy clear for them, if you're being helpful and, and you're turning out great music for them at not the craziest asks and prices, they'll keep you forever. Totally agree. That's just awesome. Um, all right. Let's say, Karita, we got you up. How's it going? Yes. Hi, guys. Hi, Andy. Um, I will be that person. I'm hi, Karita. Working on my, I'm working on my third film now. So um, please, let's connect on any music. And Karita, tell people what your nickname is. <laughs> um, the lady with the golden ear. There you go, everybody. She knows good music. Love that. Thanks for coming to the stage and introducing yourself. Is this your first time in the room, Karita? No, 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 it's not. I've been, I joined you guys quite a bit. It's been a while, though, since I've joined. I've been busy working on projects. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I joined often in the beginning, especially. This is where I think I met Andy, actually. Well, since you're here and you introduce yourself, I'm going to put you on the spot. Let me ask, what kind of music do you tend to play? Um, mostly the, for the films that I do, it's mostly like R&B, hip hop music. Um, mainly, that's what I've been working with a lot lately. 
And then how, for the films that you've done, how did you source that? Do you, like, where did you go to find it? Do you have people that put stuff together? Do you have artists that you reach out to? How did you, how did you find the music? Um, you know what? Um, just by a long shot. Um, artists that, local artists, I had people that were submitting music. Um, I actually did get a national artist on one of the soundtracks that I did or one of the movies that I did. Um, so I just reached out to people a lot of, uh, that's how I did when I first started. And now I have it where people are just sending me and overloading me with a lot of music. (laughs) Since you are overloaded, how, if the people are in this room want to get in touch with you, since we were talking about that earlier, Oh, or if you even, do you like to be contacted? And if you do, how do you prefer people reach out or do you prefer them to wait? Or what's the best thing for people in the room to know? I like to have it. Um, I take it by email. I also use disco and I do listen to all of the music that I get. Love that, Karita. That's really cool. I appreciate you you sharing that. Uh, And I wanted to share this with Andy. Uh, I guess I can share it with you guys, too. So I did a thing. I don't know. I applied applied for a licensing coordinator job with Sony Music, and I got an interview. So that's kind of a big deal for me, considering that this is only going into my third field. That is awesome. Yes. That's amazing. And you've been brave. I mean, Karita hit me up and said, she was. She just took on these films because everybody knew her as having great ears for music, and of course they were saying, "Well, you deal with the music. You deal with the music." So she did, and then she started realizing that it wasn't just listening to the music. There was this whole horrible legal thing involved <laughs> with music supervision, and that it got very, very complicated and very scary. So you've been so brave and brilliant, and if you can do that job, that would be amazing because you can supervise yes. later as well. Yes. Well yes. done. Yes, I'm really um, looking forward to seeing what's happened, what happens next. I just uh, completed my interview, so we'll see what they say next. I didn't even expect to actually get an interview. I was just thinking, okay, let me put myself on somebody's target at the very least, and I, I guess I surpassed doing that. Well, nice. we are putting all the good vibes out in the universe. Everyone on this stage and everyone in the room is putting all the good vibes out for you, Karita. We're really amen. Yeah, and Karita, remember, on. remember when I emailed you needing a real help on a real, you know, good price. Remember that, okay, please. Yes. <laughs> no worries. saying when you're famous, don't forget us little people. I will not. I'm trying to get to you guys' level. What do you mean? You all are famous to me. You're here. Look, you're on stage with us right now. We're all here together. See? You're already there. <laughs> Just You're there. Just keep believing it. That's how, yes, that's how you absolutely. get there. Thank you, guys. Uh, that's that's really great, Karita. Thanks for coming up. Sure. I love how um, for supervisors, the big favor that they know they'll need one day is like, one day I will need a great piece of music and I won't have any budget and I'm going to need you. Like, uh, like I've heard that over and over and over, which is kind of amazing so all the all the supervisors and the talent on the stage and amanda too right because you're and, and carter you're publishing isn't that kind of 50 percent of this battle the relationships and the back scratching and the favors of i know you don't have this in your you know kind of line item for music for this production or this piece of content but next time you're going to get me really good or i got you really well this time so when i ask you next time Remember that big gig I got you? Can you do it for me? And I know Andy, you and I have talked about, they don't always come through, but 99% of the time, isn't that how it works? Yes. Uh, It it helps. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, the relationships are extremely important in the music industry and entertainment industries in general. I think it's being able to trust people as well because, you know, I mean, working in the film world and things, there's a lot of skullduggery goes on like there is in the music industry with, you know, it's just half, I mean, it's hard to keep up and there's a lot of politics and everything, but in the music supervision and music community, publishers, lawyers, all of that, if you keep linking up with people, I think people know that you 
that they can trust you and that you're telling the truth. And so I think that goes a long way. And again, that comes down to the networking and, you know, just being honest. We say it's really important in this business and it really is. I like to say everybody gets one. So, you know, sometimes you try to do the best by people and they don't always come through for you and all that kind of stuff. But I let everybody, I give everybody the benefit of the doubt once since there's so much chaos and so much is up for grabs in this business and everything changes, you know, at a, at a clip. I say everybody gets one, but I think people unearth themselves pretty quick if they're not true to their word. You know, it's, it's really kind of hard to, you know, be a, a, a bad actor and stay there. Unless you're a giant corporation and then they let you stay there forever. <laughs> we won't get, that's a, that's a topic for another night. It's actually, yeah, I don't want to totally go into a totally new thing when there's only two minutes left, but there's actually, it made me think, because there's a good a certain amount of anxiety about that very first interaction in a relationship um, when the person, because you know that, you know, that's the one where you, you know, with, whether they're asking you for a favor or anything, that's the one where you've got to, like, prove yourself. That's the one that's going to lead to it. And anything could happen where you, like, you let the expectation, everybody comes in with big expectations, and if you don't meet that from, from that very first one, it's like, you know, the first gig that Steph and I did, which I'm not even sure what that was, but it's still like there's this, like, okay, you got to knock this one out the box if something, if this one doesn't really land, you know, they go in maybe thinking you're a superstar, but then you might let them down. And then after that first one, it's like, okay, now we're gravy. We're just moving. But I always find that very first interaction with a new relationship to be um, a lot of anxiety. I feel like there's a big bar to hit of expectation. On all sides, I think, you know, I think that's what we all as artists forget to you know, people on the other side in publishing companies, in uh, on the legal teams, the people who are negotiating your deals, anybody you're doing deals with on either side, production, people who are asking for music or people making the music. You know, we t- we tend to think that we're the only ones having on the music on the music creation side this anxiety, but it really is on the other side too, because you have to know that these supervisors like Andy who are amazing and Carter and Lauren are asking for favors all the time and their budgets are getting slashed (laughs) constantly. So, you know, they're also asking you for a favor and they feel bad because they have souls. So, you know, it happens all around. I'm just going to jump in real quick. I'm I'm very active on both sides. I produce movies. I worked in a studio as a music executive um, and I'm a publisher now. And I promise you, the buyer needs to find you more than you need to find the buyer because there's somebody in their organization going bring me Beyonce (laughs) 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 and they need to bring something that's going to make it across the cut and that's all y'all who are sitting in that audience right now that's a great perspective Carter I really appreciate you sharing that that's really really good to remember and I'm going to remember you saying it just like that it's going to stay in my memory (laughs) <laughs> are we also going to just glaze over the fact that Andy used the word skullduggery and just kind of like it was not like it was just a regular into... word yeah it was like... <laughs> just worked it in casually that was... the only word that I could think of that sums it up perfectly Look it, it really up. does <laughs> that's what it is it's just or oh, Tom Fuller is another one but that's too kind I... Uh... Andy, I can't wait to see you again Likewise, Carter. But Carter, seriously, Carter really has, you You really have done it from all sides, haven't you, Carter? I mean, you've worked in every area of this, so it must be fascinating. We should talk next time about which side of it you love the most. Because uh, be fa- Oh, we're totally ready <laughs> for that. To say. Woo. I, although, <laughs> you know, one thing I will say about Carter that I do love, Carter knows this, it's all business. Carter and I adore each other. There's many times where we text each other offline when we're trying to do business things together, where one of us is going, I love you, but, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this thing, but I I love you still, but, and you know what? We're still friends, always. That's because, Steph, because of the be a human edict. That That is the move for all of you everywhere. Be a human Treat people with respect. 
Uh, even the loud and obnoxious people have their own story to tell. Listen and be on good terms with all that you can uh, without giving up any soul. I just want to say I'm a fan of you, Carter, because you only have one club in your profile. And so I appreciate that. <laughs> That's badass. I kind of want to go to clubs except for good God, I hope it's this one. <laughs> uh, Carter, we've met before, right? I think we've met before, right? A teak? Hell yeah. yes, bro. Yeah, I you know came by and I gave well. you a tour of the studios, right? Yes, sir. That's man. right. Okay. I was just I was just telling Jason, I was talking to Jason, you know Jason, uh Jason yeah. Lee, my office. I was just telling him, Hey dude, I can't talk right now. I'm on a I'm on a on I'm on a clubhouse uh stage right now with Atik Iqbal. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Look at this networking happening in real time, you guys. Come on. It's so awesome. love it. oh, it's all on. It's all on. All right, people, uh, this has been our time. We, we, are, we are welcome to continue this in our after party. If you're following the club, when we go to the after party, if you've never been there, it's actually pretty awesome, and we've made some great relationships there. It is like if this room is the TED Talk, then the after party is like hanging out in the lobby afterwards. We don't discuss any music there. We discuss everything, but we don't um, have just particular people on stage. Anyone is welcome to come on the stage. In fact, when you come into the room, we're not going to pull anyone up. Just raise your hand if you want to come up to the stage and talk. Again, we're not talking about any... Um, music related or anything business related we just get to know one another and we kind of hang out uh, for a little bit so uh, in order for the room to show up in your hallway you have to be following control camp so the green icon that looks like a house at the top of this above my above my picture click on that and then follow control camp and you will be you'll have access to uh, the after party and so uh, before we leave Diraj, Steph any uh, parting words just a reminder, uh, we won't be doing the listening session this weekend, this Saturday, uh, for the holiday. But next weekend, next Saturday um, at 1 p.m. Pacific, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, we will be doing our um, normal listening session. So if you want to have your music reviewed um, and uh, reviewed for, uh, for and with Sync in Mind, Swing over to controlcamp.com. There's a submit music tab at the top and uh, it'll be queued up and we will get to it. Um, not this weekend, but next weekend. So that's all I got. That's awesome. I want to thank everyone on our stage. Atik, Clint, Koichi, Andy, Amanda, Matthew, Lauren, Carter, Karita, welcome up to the stage. And I want to say welcome to all of the new people in the room. I am seeing in my kind of follow things, a lot of new faces that I've never seen before. And I do go through all the profiles at some point. And I want to say thank you um, to everyone who's new in the room. And thank you to Laurel, who had to jump out. She said to thank everybody too. But we're super glad to have you here. And just a reminder, hit that green button if you don't already follow Control Camp and send it to a friend who you think might uh, need a little Control Camp in their life because this community only grows by you. So thanks to all of our regulars. Thanks to all the new friends and thanks to everyone on our stage. We really appreciate all your perspectives. Thanks for the great room. So much fun. Thank you. Yes. For the great room. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank, Thank you. you guys.